Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rocket's red glare the bombs bursting in air gave proof the night that our flag was still there oh say does that star-spangled banner yet wave oh the land of Thank you, Gwen, for sharing your talents with us. Hi, I'm Catherine Monet, and I'm the CEO of the National Coalition for Homeless Veterans. Welcome to our 2020 annual conference, the virtual edition. 2020 has been a year full of challenges and hardships and misery, but with challenge comes opportunity, and we're excited about the opportunities that 2020 brings as well. While we really miss seeing everyone in person for our annual conference in May, we're really excited to bring you this virtual edition of our conference. Um, over the next two weeks, we'll have a conference that'll be different, but in a really good way, I think. And we're hoping that the plenary sessions and the wonderful workshop speakers who we've lined up will uplift you, will inspire you, and will inform you so that you can take all of the wonderful things that you hear back to your communities to serve veterans. Thank you to all of you for joining us, especially those of you who served in the military and those of you who serve veterans on a day-to-day -day basis. If there's one thing that this pandemic has taught me, it's really the importance of home, given I've been home <laughs> for the last six months. Today, I'm joining you from Prince George's County, Maryland, which is the um, territory, well, the traditional territory, excuse me, of the Nacochtank and Piscataway tribes. The meaning of home is something that I've reflected a lot upon as I think about the Native American people who used to live here and the ways that this land has been colonized and settled. However, home is also important for another reason. And I think it's because it's the big thing that we all strive towards for every single veteran that touches every one of our programs and every one of our call centers and all of our hearts as they're going through that process. And I think that our founders had home in mind back in 1990 when they got together at a Department of Labor HVRP conference and decided that they were going to create an organization. You know, the irony of hosting a virtual 30th anniversary conference isn't lost on me, right? The fact that we were created at a conference, but yet we can't have one has its own meaning, but also the fact that we're all here at home trying to bring more veterans home is another really great meaning that I've thought a lot about. Some of you may already know this, but I grew up in the great state of Hawaii. And there's this really common proverb that we have, and it goes like this, Ikava mamua, kava mahope. And this roughly translates to a phrase that is, I guess, best way you could say it is that the future is in the past. And that sounds counterintuitive, but the reason it's important is because time is very cyclical and oftentimes the past informs both the present and the future. And so as we look to building for the future, we're also looking at what we've done in the past and honoring that past and learning from it. So as we here at NCHV honor our past and our 30th anniversary, let's hear a little bit from our founders who will share a little bit of where we came from and maybe where we're gonna go. 
My name is Ralph Cooper. I served in the United States Air Force. And when I got out of the military, I was able to utilize my GI Bill and go to college. Many veterans though, on the streets of Boston and all over America were homeless. They weren't able to utilize any of their benefits because they didn't have a place to live or very much food to eat. We decided to start an organization called Veterans Benefits Clearinghouse in Boston, Massachusetts, where we had 300 units of housing and we served 3,500 homeless veterans and their families through counseling on an annual basis. As a member of the homeless provider community, I was selected to be a part of a brand new national organization which was formed to take homeless vets out of the homelessness and try to get them housing. One of the problems that the National Coalition of Homeless Veterans had was money. All we wanted to do was help and do something to change the situation for the homeless veterans, but we needed to have government financial support. It was during this time that Joe Kennedy, a newly elected congressman, was a member of the House of Representatives Veterans Affairs Committee. So we went to him to convince the chairman, Sonny Montgomery, that we needed funds through that bill and to provide housing and mental support for those veterans on the streets. We heard that Sonny Montgomery believed that if a vet was homeless, he wanted to be. So he would not bring this bill forward so it could be funded. While attending an inauguration event uh, at the Kennedy's home, at Ethel Kennedy's mansion, I was made aware that Sonny Montgomery was downstairs in the recreation room by Representative Joe Kennedy. He and I knew that if we could get Chairman Sonny Montgomery to visit Boston and see BBC homeless veterans housing, we would be able to influence him to support legislation for the grant. He said he would come to Boston and wow, that was an important step and we were on our way. We got him to help pass that legislation, and Joe Kennedy asked for $400 million for us veterans to help the homeless veterans, but it got dwindled down to 10000 I mean, $10 million, I'm sorry, and it passed. That's how our program got funding and got started in 1992. Hi. My name is Robert Van Curen. I'm one of the folks that helped found the National Coalition of Homeless Veterans. By way of further introduction, they asked me to tell you that I served in Vietnam in 1969 and 1970, uh, 203 missions on river patrol boats as a machine gunner. And uh, after that, uh, like a lot of folks, I bounced around the country a little bit. Uh, I was executive director of the Vietnam Vets of San Diego for a while and eventually worked for the VA for about 14 or 15 years, uh, along with Dr. Matcheson. I was a co-founder of uh, uh, the Stand Down Program, and along with a lot of other folks. I served as the uh, chairman of the Secretary's Advisory Committee for Homeless Vets with a lot of the folks that are on the uh, board of directors uh, for the NCHV to begin with. And um, so that's my background. So look, here's what I want to really talk about with you today. The National Coalition for Homeless Veterans wasn't formed 30 years ago, really. It came to fruition 40 years ago. The formation began maybe 50 years ago, back in the 60s when veterans like myself and millions of others came home to a country that we didn't recognize and didn't particularly recognize us. And we went from denying we need help to deciding that we needed help, to trying to find help when there wasn't any or not very good help, to then a group of entrepreneurial veterans began to form their own organizations. Flower of the Dragon was one of the early ones. Uh, Swords to Plowshares, Veterans Benefits Clearinghouse, uh, Vietnam Veterans Outreach Center in Rochester, not the VA one. A lot, I could mention a lot of them, but that's, that's what went on. Then there were some seminal events that took place. Uh, the founding of the Vietnam Veterans of America, the wall, which was our touchstone, 
um, the VA finally beginning to get some homeless programs, you know, in the, in the beginning in the 80s. So all of this happened, you know, not spontaneously. Stand down helped a lot, I think. I think uh, that caused a lot of people to have to work with folks that they didn't normally want to work with or necessarily had ever worked with before. And that created some synergy around that. I just got the two minute warning, so here we go. So out of all of that began to grow more of a coalition, a loose coalition. But eventually what happened was we came together a little conference and somebody's going to tell you all about that and about what the first name was and how that changed a tale for another time. But eventually the, the, the five folks that you're you know, probably hearing from or hearing about got together. We were at the tip of the spear, but believe me, if there hadn't been a spear behind us with a lot of folks, this thing wouldn't have went down. I had a lot of help along the trail for a long time. So that's kind of what I wanted to let you know. That it, it didn't happen spontaneously and there was a whole lot of history going on during that 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, uh, into the 2000s that eventually this thing became what it is today. I want to leave you with some final thoughts. Here's some things I learned along the trail. You're going to find some things that get in your way. You have to remember you work not just for homeless veterans, you work with the homeless veterans. And working for homeless veterans is important to understand. You're going to have to put aside some of your personal feelings. You're going to have to put aside some of your political feelings sometimes. You're going to have to deal with people that don't want to do what you think is right and are in your way. And you're going to be told you can't do something that you think needs to be done. Well, let me tell you, I was told that over and over again. No, you can't do that. You know, all the guys that formed this and the women that formed these organizations were told you can't do this. Well, it, it can get done. You're the new generation of warriors. You know, we're the old guard. I'm doing this tape and that's, <laughs> I'm done, really. I'm not involved anymore. And a lot of these other folks aren't either. It's on you. You have to be the new force. So look, do what needs to be done. Speak truth to power, as they say. Stand up for what's right. Get the job done. That's it, okay? So look, take care of yourselves. Be safe. God bless. And uh, I hope to see you along the trail somewhere. Maybe we will. Bye-bye. Hello, I'm Michael Blecker. I am a uh, combat Vietnam veteran. I'm also very proud to be one of the founders of uh, the National Coalition of Homeless Veterans. I'm also the uh, director of Swords to Plowshares in San Francisco. So... Um, when we decided, got together, uh, I believe back in 1989 in Jacksonville, Florida, <clears throat> uh, all of us, especially the founders, really had a sense of the importance of a community-based organization. We're all like from those areas. All of us had really worked in our communities, right? Working vets in our communities, uh, I think in San, St. Louis and Kansas City and uh, Nashville, I should say, and in San Francisco and of course San Diego and in Boston, Roxbury in particular. And so sort of we, to sort of like to work in that area and feel you, you, there's certain understandings and values you really are sort of second nature. One is uh, that you're not afraid of those you serve, that you're a veteran, they're a veteran, you don't put barriers up, in fact, you break them down. And you don't fear those who you're serving, even though, as we all know, veterans who are suffering, it's not a pretty picture, but you have to address it in a respectful, dignified, fearless way and have it resonate with them so they feel, right, that you're with them, you're on their side, you're who they are. So we brought, I think that was probably the most powerful value we brought, we understood and we brought to the table and we were like committed to that sense of support in communities across the country, really, where we saw this growing need of veterans who are suffering. And uh, homelessness was just sort of the epitome of a, a continuum of, of suffering, you know, whether it was, uh, you know, feeling isolated from families, whether it was, uh, you know, difficulty with work, whether it was poverty, uh, you know, it's like a, the mind, the, the psychology, but also just the mind, uh, the body, uh, really, and the spirit. All those things had to be really addressed, and those are the values we brought to bear from our experience working in our communities. And I think when we recognize <clears throat> We were brought together in that particular time, really, on the government's dime, because, you know, we had very little dough to, you know, go to meetings or travel, and, uh, you know, we, we really, every sort of penny was devoted to sort of preserving our care and services. So we recognized, and fortunately, there were folks, you know, in that room who, who had a lot of experience working with national situations and knew how to address 
policies, particularly I'm thinking of Bill and Jerry Washington, who really worked in national efforts, whether it was VBA or National Association of Concerned Vets, and they knew what it took to sort of like make sure our voices were heard and we needed to have a presence because there were no voices for veterans, especially veterans who were low income, especially veterans who were potentially on the street. They, were, they didn't have a voice, right? The VSOs were not there for them, right? And we had to fight and we had to make sure that they were going to get their needs addressed. That meant fighting and supporting and addressing and, and being very active. They had that experience. That was very important. So I think they really recognize the importance of like taking advantage of this organizing moment. And then, of course, we have Ralph, who, Ralph Cooper, who established an organization in Roxbury, right? And had understood the strength of organizing veterans, who really had a strong connection with the minority veterans and who were a big part of that, uh, of the veterans who were placed, at, in, placed in arm's way, right? By these wars. And who really understood that and brought that really strength to us that, and then, of course, we we're all sort of like have a debt to Robert Van Curen, who was really, who showed us through the stand down campaign back in the day when it was started, who understood and was again fearless uh, by bringing all these veterans together and understood the importance of organizing, right? And he was really uh, the inspiration, I would say, for all of us. And I think we knew that uh, this was our moment to do it. If not us, who? Not now, when, right? And so that was really what drove us to sort of like go beyond this bureaucracy, go beyond what this, you know, conference, this uh, national, this, uh, this Department of Labor event, and really create something there that would sustain itself. And I think that those were sort of the driving forces of why we sort of made this decision to. Uh, you know, create something that would sustain itself, and uh, and it has, right? And it's really benefited and alleviated a lot of suffering of veterans. And of course, our work is far from being done, but I think it's very important that NCHV uh, has sustained itself over these years, and I'm proud to have played a part in that. Hello, my name's Bill Elmore. I'm one of the founders of the National Coalition for Homeless Veterans. I'm a United States Air Force veteran, served during the Vietnam era. I'm from St. Louis, and my work with veterans started in the early 1970s through a self-help organization called the Veterans Service Centers, where we had thousands of veterans literally come through our doors looking for assistance, insight, guidance, answers, et cetera, et cetera and we were the only non-bureaucratic place they could go to get those answers. Anyway, I was going to give you a history lesson about all the trials and travails that our generation of veterans had to deal with leading to 1990, but the more I think about this, the more I understand that our president has already taken us back to the worst of those bad old days. He's not the first to call veterans losers or to accuse us of not even being veterans. We heard that from people, from our peers and from our non-veteran peers back in the early and the mid 70s. And that's what we had to work to overcome. I think today the message for me to you is that the lessons we've learned with 30 years of work in creating, managing, growing, not just the National Coalition for Homeless Veterans, but all the great work that all the members have done and continue to do, is that those lessons are going to need to be captured and revisited because today's economy, I'm fearful, is only going to get worse and worse and worse. And in that context, how do you help individuals and families climb out of the hopelessness that is homelessness in America, because that unfortunately may be what's coming on a great grand scale. I'm sorry to say that. So my message to you is, one, own the coalition, make it yours, make it work, make it be your voice in D.C., in the policymakers' offices, in the halls of Congress, and in administrations, and two, understand 
the lessons you've learned the easy and the hard way. I want to thank our founders for sharing their insights on NCHV. In our 30 years of being an organization, we've collectively moved tens of thousands of veterans from homelessness into permanent housing and have connected them to benefits, services, housing, and the care that they need to restore themselves. One of the reasons for the success is the continued ability to meet veterans where they're at and to listen to them and hear what they need to better understand how we can help them. NCHV was founded during a time when there were very few resources available for veterans experiencing homelessness. The only major dedicated program was the Homeless Veterans Reintegration Program and jobs and employment and training is wonderful. But at the end of the day, without shelter, it's very hard to sustain housing and to sustain your employment. And so it was clear that the founders felt like more needed to be done and more assistance should be provided at VA to fill the gaps from shelter all the way through to rapid rehousing and permanent supportive housing and everywhere in between. And NCHV has had a hand in the creation of all of that. While no housing intervention is beyond reproach, in the last decade, there has been a radical, and I know positive, very positive, shift in how we approach efforts to end homelessness. As a field, we've really focused in on listening to people experiencing homelessness and working hard to meet their needs, rather than requiring them to fit into a narrow mold of the programs that we have available in order to access housing or shelter or care. Instead, the need for housing is the primary issue that gets resolved, and then all of the interventions follow that. So the supportive services, the health care, the case management, everything gets wrapped around the veteran, and that's been a good thing. The shift to housing first has been wonderful for efforts to end veteran homelessness, and it is in large part the reason that we've made such great progress on reducing veteran homelessness over the last decade. I'm going to be really blunt and say that I think and NCHV thinks that Housing First works, provided that adequate support services come with housing and are made available to the people who are in the housing. It works both from a human perspective in terms of satisfying someone's basic hierarchy of needs and from the perspective of implementing evidence-based practices to help veterans access housing. Certain studies of Housing First have found that after five years, 88% of Housing First um, clients have remained housed as compared to 47% of a control group that went through a residential treatment program. Similarly, we know that employment and other benefits are crucial to ensuring that veterans can remain housed once they're in housing. And as a rule, NCHV has always supported employment and income and housing stability and the connection between the two. However, we are in an interesting environment and an interesting economy. And the reality is that there's not yet an end in sight on this pandemic, meaning that widespread unemployment could still be our reality in the winter, in the fall, maybe even into the spring. Now, that's problematic given the massive rental arrears that certain people have accrued during the pandemic and given that we're in the midst of a rental housing crisis, veteran homelessness feels sort of like the canary in the coal mine. We need significantly more quality affordable housing if we want to end homelessness and communities need to identify creative ways to make that a reality. During this conference and with the support of the Home Depot Foundation, we're actually really pleased to be launching the Road Home podcast. And the Road Home podcast will focus in on creative funding sources that communities have used to create affordable housing for veterans in their community. All of these pressures highlight the need for Congress to come together to support additional rental relief, a more comprehensive eviction moratorium, and full funding for VA to support the programs that are designed to help veterans experiencing homelessness. That's the bare minimum that we should expect of our elected officials. And I hope that all of you will reach out to your members of Congress to hold them accountable to these goals and let them know about the challenges that the veterans in your programs and in your communities are facing. If they don't hear from us, they don't know that there's a problem and we won't get the resources that we need to solve this problem. So please, I beg of you, reach out.
and advocate. And my last words of wisdom are very much tied to advocacy. I hope that all of you will vote like your lives and the lives of your clients depend upon it. The people who we choose to represent us at the federal, local, and state level impact our ability to access the resources, the support, and build the housing that we need to end veteran homelessness. Veterans are known for high levels of civic engagement, so we're asking that each and every one of you go home and you communicate with your clients about the importance of voting, the importance of ensuring that you know how to vote and that you're registered, and that you all work to make plans with your veterans to ensure that they vote. I thank you for joining us today. Hello everyone, I'm Erica Headley with the Home Depot Foundation coming to you from my home in Atlanta, Georgia. Thank you for tuning in to this year's NCHV virtual conference. This is one of my favorite events of the year, getting to see friends and partners coming together with one mission of ending veteran homelessness. It saddens me that we all can't be together face to face, but we all know COVID-19 has not slowed down the work. If anything, it has accelerated the urgency and the Home Depot Foundation cannot thank each and every one of you enough for continuing to support veterans during this challenging time. And thank you to NCHV for putting together this virtual experience for us so we would not be completely missing out this year. As many of you know, the Home Depot Foundation has made improving the lives and homes of veterans a priority since 2011. Since then, we've invested over $350 million towards our goal of a half a billion dollars by 2025. This includes the homes of 47,000 veterans. It is not only a passion of the foundation, but a passion of the 400 plus associates across the country. Each year, thousands of our associates spend their time off volunteering with Team Depot to help ensure veterans have safe and reliable homes. Our work in the veteran homeless space comes to life in two different ways. Through partnerships with organizations such as NCHV, who keep us up to speed on the different challenges communities are facing day to day. Secondly, through the Veteran Housing Grant Program, which I'm sure some of you are familiar with. This program supports new construction and rehabilitation of permanent supportive housing developments across the country. We did have to put a pause on this program for 2020 due to COVID-19. However, I am happy to tell you that we will be opening this program up in 2021. Please keep a lookout on our website to, for the deadlines that should be posted by the end of this year. On behalf of the Home Depot Foundation, I want to say thank you to each and every one of you for the work you're doing for veterans experiencing homelessness. I know we tell you this every year, but truly mean it when we say that our work cannot be done without the work of your organizations on the ground day in and day out. I'm going to leave you with a short video that was produced um, at the end of last year in 2019 of our Orange Army Team Depot out in the communities um, doing work along with organizations such as yourselves. I hope you all enjoy the next two weeks of sessions and I look forward to hopefully seeing ne you next year in 2021. A single pair of hands can do a lot. They can paint a fence, build a shelf, install a floor. That's what doers do. But thousands of hands, tens of thousands, working together, these hands are helping change lives. They're improving homes for veterans across the country, 45,000 of them so far. These hands support job skills training for returning vets, and that helps those veterans provide for their families. These are our hands. They're picking up tools and fixing problems, building communities, giving back. This is what our doers do. And the real power of these hands isn't just that they're doing, they're doing good. The Home Depot, how doers get more done. Thank you, Erica and the Home Depot Foundation. It is my pleasure to introduce our next speaker. On January 6th of 2020, John Maui was sworn in as the Assistant Secretary for the U.S. Department of Labor's Veterans Employment and Training Service. Prior to that, Mr. Lowry led the U.S. Supply Chain and Operations Practice for Egon Zender, a corporate leadership advisory firm. He also has many years in the, of leadership in the manufacturing industry, 
including serving as Chief Operating Officer for Allied Recreation Group and over 12 years in leadership positions at Harley Davidson. Mr. Lowry is a Marine Corps veteran with over 15 years of active duty and 10 years in the reserve. In 1991, he led a force recon platoon in the first Gulf War. He was deployed again in 2005 to Djibouti as part of the global war on terrorism. He retired from the Marines in 2009 as a Colonel. Mr. Lowry has a bachelor's degree from Princeton University, as well as master's degrees from Stanford University, Harvard Business School, and the U.S. Army War College. Please welcome Assistant Secretary John Lowry. Good afternoon. I'm John Lowry, the Department of Labor's Assistant Secretary for Veterans Employment and Training. I appreciate the opportunity to provide comments for the opening of this 30th National Coalition for Homeless Veterans Annual Conference. As a Marine Corps veteran, I am honored to join you in your first ever virtual conference as we adapt and overcome the challenges of 2020 to continue this important annual tradition of partnership and collaboration. I want to personally thank everyone for your meaningful assistance to veterans in critical need, our homeless veterans. Since the beginning of the year, I've had the privilege to lead the Veterans Employment and Training Service, or as we call it, VETS, which is a fitting and probably not accidental acronym. At VETS, we administer a number of programs that support the employment and training needs of veterans of all eras. After swearing into this position, one of my first visits was to a homeless veterans reintegration program grantee in Washington, D.C. A few weeks later, I visited another HVRP grantee in Minneapolis. Meeting veterans striving to overcome homelessness and being served by dedicated teams helping get those veterans back on their feet were humbling experiences. During both of my visits, I heard veterans tell me the same thing. This place and this staff saved my life. At VETS, we are so grateful to be able to partner with this coalition that is literally saving lives. Thank you. Our agency vision is to enable all veterans to reach their full potential in the workplace. It's not good enough just to help find veterans jobs. We want them to find work that will challenge them, help them learn and grow, and put them in a position to make the biggest impact. Achieving this vision not only helps veterans, their families, and the companies they serve, but when you aggregate the full potential of the veteran impact, it's also good for America's prosperity and security. This vision informs our two agency priorities. The first is getting the transition right. If we can crank an extra degree or two of slope on somebody's career trajectory and have them hit that slope with a running start right when they first hang up the uniform, the compounding benefits of that over time are amazing. Conversely, if we get the transition wrong, the negative implications can last a lifetime. Many of you know this hard fact all too well. Our second priority is having the right strategic partnerships to maximize our impact on veteran employment outcomes and better harness the collective energies of the many organizations in this space. One of our longest partnerships has been the NCHV, 30 years. Our partnership with the NCHV and with our HVRP grantees help homeless veterans find new hope. We know that employment is critical to housing stability as employment leads to financial independence, a sense of purpose, social connectedness, and strength and resiliency. You help our homeless veterans find not just jobs, but the right jobs for them, and in so doing, are helping veterans reach their full potential. VETS also partners with the state workforce system that includes nearly 2,400 American job centers. These AJCs play an essential role, especially where no HVRPs are present. VETS funds the Job for Veterans State Grants Program, which funds the Disabled Veterans Outreach Program specialists who provide intensive employment services for veterans with significant barriers to employment, and local veterans employment representative staff who connect local businesses with AJCs and veterans seeking employment. As you know, AJCs also help veterans connect to other workforce programs, and veterans receive priority front-of-line services for all workforce programs in AJCs. So what's the future look like? 
HBRP, the only federal grant program that focuses exclusively on workforce reintegration for veterans experiencing homelessness or are at risk of becoming homeless, will continue to be a critical program, especially during these challenging times. HVRP helps homeless veterans obtain meaningful employment and helps develop effective service delivery systems to address the complex problems they encounter. Last year, VETS grantees served nearly 20,000 homeless veterans through HVRP with a 65% job placement rate. President Trump signed into law $55 million for fiscal year 2020, representing a 10% increase over 2019 for this program. I'm also encouraged by HVRP's partnership with the VA and HUD programs, VSOs, faith-based organization, and others which allow us to serve more veterans in more places who can benefit from employment services. As many of you know, by the end of 2019, veteran unemployment had continued its years of steady decreases, which is certainly a credit to your partnership with the administration, as well as your continued advocacy and support of veterans. In fact, the average monthly veteran unemployment rate last year was 3.1%, the best since 2000, and five of those months in 2019 achieved lower seasonally adjusted rates than any month from any other year on record. While unemployment has understandably increased due to COVID-19, veterans today are employed at significantly higher rates than their non-veteran counterparts, which says to me that employers recognize the value of veterans and want to hold on to them, especially during these challenging times. While COVID has inflicted economic damages, veteran unemployment today is better than where it was during the depth of the Great Recession. In fact, we have many things going for us now that we didn't have then. First of all, we've recently made the journey to record low veteran unemployment, and we know how to do it again. Secondly, our agency is better resourced today than we were a decade ago. And finally, and perhaps most importantly, we know that the majority of those who were recently furloughed will be able to return to their former jobs safely. This in no way is to suggest that the road to recovery will not have challenges along the way, but it is to say that together we are up to the challenge of putting our unemployed veterans back to work. Let me close by thanking you once again for your significant contributions and support of veterans in need. I look forward to learning from you throughout this conference and look forward to our future collaboration. At VETS, we recognize that your success enables veterans to succeed, and I want to assure you that we are committed to being a good partner with you on our shared journey. Thank you. Hello, I'm Ruth Christofferson. Director of City Salutes, City's company-wide initiative supporting veterans, military members, and their families. I'm also a 30-year veteran with the United States Air Force. Through City Salutes, we partner with organizations across the U.S. to provide support of affordable housing, financial education, employment, employee engagement, and transition services for our veterans. In 2012, we partnered with LISC and National Equity Fund to develop Bring Them Homes. This program provides support through pre-development funding as well as technical assistance. One of our partners, Green Extreme Homes, developed a housing project in Dallas, Texas for homeless female veterans. This is a growing need in that area and a critical asset for that market. This house was not only developed through Green Extreme Homes creativity, through funding partners and through Bring Them Homes, but also through a lot of hard work by employees of City, Our employees stood up and were at that house day in and day out working together to create a home for these female veterans. Please join me in watching this video and celebrating what we can all do when we work together to help our veterans. Thank you. No one wants to say I've been in the military for 10 years, but I'm homeless. It's kind of sad that we find it more socially acceptable to sleep in our cars in 100 degree heat in Texas than to say, I need help. Sometimes the, the things that we do in the service don't translate into the civilian sector. So we need help in, in bridging that gap. We need homes for veterans, not just men veterans, but women veterans too. 
They need somebody to provide a place so they can get on their feet and go out into the world. Homeless female veterans are the highest growing percentage of homeless veterans in Texas, helping them return to a normal, sustainable lifestyle is probably one of the worthiest endeavors we've ever undertaken. Welcome to the Reed House on Mullins. The Reed House on Mullins is a transitional home for female veterans. These are female veterans that have some kind of barrier to self-sustainability. So this home is to give them a nurturing, safe environment where they can live with dignity while they get back on their feet. Living at the Reed House at Mullins really just gives me hope. It's clean, it's safe, it's affordable. The Reed House is a seven bedroom, four and a half bath, it's a highly energy efficient home built under the Department of Energy's Zero Energy Ready Home Guidelines. When I heard about this project to build a transitional home for female vets, I knew I had to be a part of it. I felt so passionate about what this house represented and I wanted the women that were going to come and live here to feel like people who put the time and effort into building this home love them. They actually cared enough to pay attention to the details. There are people out there who actually appreciate veterans, not just saying, you know, thank you for your service. There's people out here that are showing exactly what that means. One of the things that makes this really unique is our City Salutes Network. They took the time. Over the last 17 months, they got hundreds of volunteers. They spent over 2,400 hours here. They organized over 30 events to make this a reality. We couldn't do what we do and serve the community that we serve and help the people we serve without city. We literally call it the house that city built. We've had such a great rapport with the city volunteers, everybody working toward the same thing in building an energy efficient, uh, sustainable home for our veterans. The Reed House on Mullins was named after a member of our steering committee, Greg Reed, who was one of our early volunteers when we were doing the wall construction. Unfortunately, he passed away as a result of a motorcycle accident, riding his bike on his way into work. Greg was an Army veteran who joined the service at 17 years old. He was a crew chief for the Black Hawk helicopters and the 101st Airborne. It was something that he was very proud of and the lessons that he learned from his time in the military shaped him forever. Whether it was learning lessons about integrity, compassion, hard work, loyalty and dedication. And I think that's what Greg brought not only to City and City Salutes, but to this project, the Reed House on Mullins. It is my hope that the women who walk through these doors that are surrounded by the walls that Greg helped build. Never forget how much they are loved. City has been a partner of Green Extreme Homes for eight years now, and together we have provided over 150 veterans housing that were previously homeless. It's been a really close partnership here in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Like I said, I'm 68 years old. I'm a Vietnam vet. I fought in the war and I'm fighting now for my very life. Right here on the streets of Los Angeles. That's right. Leonardo's statement that he fought in the war and he's fighting for his life every day on the streets of Los Angeles sticks with me to this day. It's one of the most powerful statements in the 10 years that I've been interviewing homeless people. Hi, my name is Mark Horvath. I'm the founder of Invisible People. Through innovative storytelling, journalism, education, and advocacy, we're working to end homelessness, just like many of you. And congratulations on 30-year anniversary. I'm honored to be asked to spend some time with you. 
A big part of my work is empowering homeless people to share their own story. I was homeless myself, and one thing I've learned by doing all this is that there seems to be a disconnect between the people that are making the decisions that affect homelessness and homeless people and homeless people themselves. As I travel, and I've been to over nine different countries and 300 different cities, there's one constant, one constant from Tampa to Anchorage, Alaska, to St. Louis, to Boston, to Los Angeles. And that is the insane amount of times that a homeless person has to ask for help and they just get turned away. Right now, there's a lot of support for veterans. To a certain extent. Can you explain that? Um, I was told I wasn't homeless enough. What's not homeless enough? I, that's what and I, I don't asked. mean to laugh. You're well, here in a tent. And I laugh too. First, and then I got pissed because I'm like, what do I got to do? Sleep on your patio? And she goes, no, sir, you can't do that. I'm like, well, what do I have to do? Well, you have to have 180 days on the street. And I'm like, you're kidding me. So I had to be on the street for 180 days to become homeless enough. For the VA to help you. Correct. Not homeless enough. Randy's living in a tent, not by choice, and he's being told he's not homeless enough. For thousands upon thousands of homeless veterans across this country, they're trying to get help only to be pushed away or turned away or given dead-end referrals. I totally understand that there's not enough resources and we need to triage to help the most vulnerable, but bureaucracy kills. All across this country, over and over, I hear from every homeless person the amount of times, the insane amount of times, they've tried to get help just to be turned away. This is Conrad. This is his second day living in a safe parking. This is my, uh, this is my second day uh, sleeping in the car and uh, I don't have to uh, drive for like an hour and a half to get to my VA appointments. And uh, it's kind of like really being in the, uh, when I was in the military when I was camping out, uh, except that uh, I feel a little safe because we do have some security here. VA disability, when I was in the uh, war, did three tours in Iraq. And uh, some of the paperwork was not, uh, was not right. Uh, and they asked me for uh, put in for a change of address. Well, I did that, hopefully I'll be able to get uh, my disability because uh, it's really hurting me now. So I have to make that ultimate sacrifice. Speaking of bureaucracy, it took Los Angeles County five years to approve the first safe parking program. Safe parking programs are a very cost-effective and quick way to help people who are living in their cars. And just using the safe parking as an example, by listening to homeless people, you're going to find solutions to help end homelessness. We have to reduce the bureaucracy. We have to reduce the time it takes from an idea to implementation. We have to get better to help people. The affordable housing crisis is increasing homelessness and along with it criminalization of homelessness is also growing everybody deserve a, a, a house uh, at least a place that, where they can rent it according to their income because uh, everybody is not making a hundred thousand dollars a year everybody not the Rockefellers and the Kennedys and everything so we need houses that are low income for people and that would be rented to them according to their income, that is zero to thirty percent. Here in Denver, we have two hundred and we have we have twenty three thousand houses that are empty, but they on the high end, sixty percent and up, uh, which means that a one bedroom. Well, I'm gonna take a studio. A studio is costing you about fourteen, fifteen hundred dollars just to move in, and that's no bigger than a jail cell. Right. Right. 
And now, for being outside, you've gotten ticketed. Yes. Uh, I got a ticket three times. The first time was about two and a half years ago, I guess. Um, I got two tickets, both within a 12-hour span of each other. Um, this time I was out here for about, uh, I guess, about three and a half months. And I got a ticket this time, which I'm fighting in court. I'm doing court October the 11th. I was supposed to go August the 5th, but they uh, set it back. So um, I'm fighting it because I feel that me being a Marine, that uh, I, I fought for these rights. And I fought to be able to choose on how I want to live my life if I don't want to go to a shelter. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that. I break my stuff down every morning, like most people do, and uh, go on about my day. Some people, they, they don't have the luxury of that, of moving around like I can. So what was the ticket for? The ticket for urban camping. I was not in the military, so I can't tell you what it's like. But I did live in a faith-based homeless shelter for seven years. When the structure was gone, many people went back to drinking and using, went back to their old lifestyle, went back to homelessness. Lynette lives in her car. After serving in the military, it was a huge crisis for her to go back home and not have structure. Um, I have PTSD from going to war twice. And the core of me likes structure. It likes discipline. It likes to have evidence. It likes to have understanding about things. And I realize not everybody thinks that way. So when I moved back home with my family in Compton, we got into fights and disagreements about some of my beliefs. One belief of mine is that the household should be clean. There should not be filth. Everything has a place. Um, you can make a mess, but you have to clean up that mess. I met Kaladianka in San Francisco recently in a program run for homeless veterans to get them off the streets into a hotel because of the pandemic. Kaladianka has been outside off and on since 2001. She's tried to work with the system, but again, bureaucracy has prevented her from getting the support she needs. And when this hotel program ends, she still needs housing. And that's where we all come in. We need to be able to fix the broken system so people like Kaladianka can get the support they need. It's very humiliating to have served and then have to go through the process. I would go stay in the shelters to for them to examine me. And then as soon as the city would start putting programs in place for me, then the VA office would come and then put me in a program when I asked them, why am I being put in a program without a diagnosis? So right now, um, Mr. Grant, uh, Tasha, Brene, and Ms. Jackson, they, uh, have helped me maintain this, this placement. And the organization is an organization that helps homeless veterans. Yes, it's called Swords to Plowshares. Yeah. But they have to get permission from, from the VA. So I have complied, I've given all my medical records, my service, uh, my homeless paperwork from New York in 2017. And I'm waiting for them to overturn the, yeah. the ruling for my Section 8 voucher. The significant problems we have cannot be solved at the same level of thinking with which we created them. Albert Einstein. These are photos from the late 1800s of homeless shelters. Well, they're not really photos, they're drawings. This is a photo that I took of the Glendale Winter Shelter. In a hundred years time, in over a hundred years, we're still warehousing people. This is Lanny. Lanny was in the Air Force. He was extremely intelligent and so gentle and kind. His wife died, and Lanny started drinking himself to death. He would often blow a point four eight. I was an outreach worker in Los Angeles at the time, and I committed to helping Lanny. It took years and years, but we finally were able to get the support he needed and get him into housing. 
Right, he's gone. Yeah. He's gone. He's gone. He's out hiding. And you know, when I was talking to this morning, I was trying to get him. You know, where did you go? Whoa, 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 whoa. That's him. Where? Right here, right up there. Right up there to your right. Yeah. You want to stop? Uh, yeah, but pull up. Let me just go. Because you're the one I, I asked to address. You're going to make me cry, Lanny. Because uh, you're making me cry. Because <laughs> I love you. I love you too, Lanny. And I, I don't want anything bad to happen. Tell me what you're going to help me with. Anything else? Well, we're close. We're closest we've been in three years to get you into housing. Okay. We're the closest we've been. I was a street outreach worker, and our uh, mission in that previous program was to identify people that were particularly vulnerable because of their mental illness or addiction, and if we felt they might be a danger to people, we would take them to Bellevue Hospital. Two or three weeks after the hospitalization, that same person would be back on the street. The repetition of that cycle began to be very disturbing and began to raise a number of questions of like, what are we doing? Maybe you have a little short-term gain, but that person just spent 30 days in the hospital at $1,500 a day. That's $45,000. We could have bought them a, a condo, you know, certainly paid the rent for a long time. What we decided to do was to start listening to the people on the street. and take our cue about what to do from them. It led very, very quickly to the idea that housing is the most important thing to a homeless person, regardless of mental illness or addiction or anything else. And once they're housed, they'll consider it. Maybe treatment, maybe reconnecting with family, maybe having their kids come back, maybe looking for a job. But the first response was always housing. Here we are in um, Lanny's new apartment, and uh, he actually went and did put all his cupboards and stuff away. That's pretty amazing, man. And uh, how long has it been since you've uh, had an apartment? Oh, it seems like a century. <laughs> a century? <laughs> yeah. Well, almost has, because yeah. you were homeless since 2002. Right. That's, that's insane. Yeah, it is. So, uh, how are you feeling? Uh, elated. Very good. Yeah? It yeah. hasn't hit me yet. I feel human again. You feel human again. <laughs> how did getting a set of keys make you feel different? Uh, that I was finally home. That yeah. I was finally in a place where I can start focusing on bettering myself. The remarkable thing was that people did so well. People, uh, once housed, began to have a life, even though they still suffered with addiction and mental illness, people have a functional ability that is quite separate from their diagnosis, it turns out. You can believe that the government is after you, or that there are people flying in from outer space and, and they're going to you know, take over the planet. And leaving all that aside, you can still go, you know, get a ham and cheese sandwich and some french fries and have a meal or go shopping and, and all of that. They are like two hands doing independent things. So that was a great surprise. And, and I think most gratifying was the fact that people can get housed immediately from the street and they can be supported to keep that housing. We know how to end homelessness. We've known for a long time. We just lack the public and political will to make it happen. That's where you all come in. We must continue to fight for more affordable housing and more resources to help end homelessness. And let me give you a little challenge. If you're an executive or mid-level management or if you are working in the homeless sector and you don't have any direct connection with homeless people, and I'm not talking about walking down the hall of your facility saying hello to people in the morning. 
a minimum of four hours a month, direct frontline services, working with homeless people. You're going to hear amazing stories that are going to encourage you. And you're going to hear about how the system is broken. And quite possibly, you may be able to fix some of the bureaucracy and make it easier for homeless people to get the help they need. Four hours a month, minimum, connecting to homeless people on the front line. You can do it. Thank you so much for having me. Helping a veteran exit homelessness can be complicated and messy, but also really rewarding. And responding to all of this and doing that same work in the midst of a pandemic is all the more challenging. So I want each and every one of you to know that I salute you for your hard work and all of the effort that you put into helping veterans go home. Now, for some groups of people, particularly people of color or people who are part of other marginalized groups, that work is just a little more challenging. And if you're one of those people, I'm talking to you for the next few minutes. Sometimes this work can be really hard and really draining while also being rewarding. But some days it is just really draining and not rewarding. And there are days when you go home and you wanna relax and you see yet another murder at the hands of police or yet another murder at the hands of someone who thought it was okay to take the lives of a protester. And that's not okay. And it drains people, it causes anguish. It's hard to watch people die who look like they could be your brother or your sister. And sometimes I think that as a field, we don't always acknowledge that invisible burden that some of our peers and our colleagues have to carry along with the burdens that they're carrying for the veterans they're serving. And so if you're one of those people, I want you to know that I see you and that I respect you and that we here at NCHV think the world of you and everything that you're doing. It's not easy seeing police brutality every day, day in and day out on TV. It's certainly not easy seeing police taking actions against people who are experiencing homelessness, whether it's criminalizing sleeping outside or sitting outside by giving tickets, or whether it's sweeping encampments and taking people's possessions, or whether it's something even worse, like firing a canister of tear gas at them. I mean, that's simply not okay. And I think you all know that that's not something that NCHV supports. But I want you to know on an individual basis that sometimes the work feels heavy and so does personal life. But I need every single one of you to remember to make time for yourself and your needs when it gets heavy. Because the thing about this fight to end veteran homelessness is that it takes all of us. We're a movement together. And we need every last one of you. So when one of us is down, we all fall down. Bringing this back up to the policy level, however, we all know that Black veterans are at higher risk of becoming homeless, right? The homeless veteran population is about 33% African-American, whereas the veteran population generally is about 15% African-American. The reality here is that there is a group of veterans that is getting left behind. And being left behind at that higher rate should be unacceptable to anyone. So here's what I'm doing today. I'm calling on each of you to play a more active role and to take charge of understanding what's going on in your program, in your communities, and in your country. Diversity, equity, inclusion, and ultimately belonging, right? All four things need to be critical parts of your organization's push to end veteran homelessness. And that can look a couple of different ways. If you're new to this and you haven't started, there's gonna be a really great workshop next week that'll walk you through a lot of the great details on how to get started and what you can do to take some simple steps. But I think one of the first things that you should probably look at is who is becoming homeless in your community? And how does that compare to the veterans who are becoming homeless or the veterans who are becoming homeless in the nation? And figure out where your community has differences and start to think about why. Because that'll lead you down a path of figuring out 
what systems feed into your homeless system, what kinds of changes you could make to ensure that, you know, people are being treated equitably and fairly. And that's really important. I think we owe it to the veterans who we serve to ensure that everyone is getting a fair shake and that no one's getting left behind just because somebody's got a bias against them based on the color of their skin or their disability or their gender identity. It's simply not acceptable. And I hope that all of you will stand with NCH3 in saying that and in turning that into action. One of the interesting things that we think a lot about in this space is perpetuating inequities within our system. But the fact of the matter is that nobody becomes homeless in a vacuum, right? Oftentimes it's another system or systems that have failed somebody based on an individual bias or a systemic or institutionalized bias that somehow just seems to work against a group of people, sometimes by accident and sometimes by design. And so when we think about the needs of minority veterans, you know, this pandemic has really magnified some of the systemic and institutional issues that have tended to work against them and lead them to become homeless at a higher rate. Here at NCHV, we think that that's not okay. And one of the things that we are working on is taking a really good look at some of the bigger picture systems that might lead somebody to become homeless, to think about what we can do or what policy changes can be made to prevent people from falling into homelessness at a higher rate. We believe that homelessness prevention shouldn't only be something that happens within the homeless system or within the housing counseling system or foreclosure mitigation programs, right? Homeless, homelessness prevention should really look like access to great jobs, access to education opportunities that will allow someone to thrive, affordable housing, good transit, you know, all of the things that a veteran would need to be successful in life. And when one or more of those things doesn't fall into place, that's when veterans show up on our front door. And we're looking forward to a day where no veteran becomes homeless. So we're doing some work in that space and we hope to have more to share with you in the days to come. One of our really great partners in this work is Ron Armstead. And I wanna talk about Ron for a few minutes cause he's had a really big impact on me and the work that we've been doing at NCHV. Uh, Ron, is one of the founders of the Congressional Black Caucus Veterans Brain Trust. Um, he is currently the executive director, and he and NCHB founder Ralph Cooper also co-founded the Veterans Benefits Clearinghouse up in Massachusetts. So Ron is a triple threat. He's someone who I've come to rely on for his insights and his expertise and his willingness to mentor, you know, a young person like me. But he's a licensed social worker. He's got a master's degree in city planning from MIT. It's kind of a big deal. And so Ron has done some really great work over the course of his life in terms of illuminating the needs of Black veterans and trying to ensure that their housing needs are met. And so for that reason, we're awarding Ron with the 2020 Thomas Wynn Senior Memorial Award for Lifetime Achievement. We so appreciate everything that he's done for Black veterans and for NCHV and for homeless veterans in Massachusetts. And, you know, we're proud to count him as one of our partners. Thank you, Ron. My name is Steve Benz, and I'm the board chairman for the National Coalition for Homeless Veterans. I'm here today to present an Unsung Hero Award. If unsung means that people don't know what it is that you're doing, 
Um, this person may be unsung to some people, but for those of us who work with her, she's far from being unsung because if she didn't do what she does, we couldn't remotely do what we do. And I'm talking about the operations manager at the National Coalition for Homeless Veterans, Karen Christian. Karen does many, many, many things at the National Coalition for Homeless Veterans, but I'm gonna to focus today on a couple of things that she's done. One thing that she's done, which has made us all successful as an organization and has helped continue the fight um, against veteran homelessness out in the communities on the, the largest, most macro level. And another thing that she's done that connects with people as individuals right in the middle of challenging circumstances. Last fall, before anyone knew that this thing called COVID was gonna come along, Karen looked at the systems at the National Coalition for Homeless Veterans and said, these things need a major upgrade. We need a better computer platform. We need better SharePoint sites. We need all of the type of IT infrastructure and communication ability that we should have that we don't. And she started all that on her own. She took that on and she built all of that for us. And that would have been significant and important at any time, but it could not have been more significant and important given the times into which we were at it. Had Karen not done that back in the fall, when we had to send everybody home in March due to the pandemic, we would not have been able to do what we were able to do because our systems just wouldn't have been able to handle that. We still had to work with everything that was happening in, in the programs around the country. We still had to do congressional testimony. We still had to be able to communicate efficiently with our partners. All of that had to happen and that would not have happened and it wouldn't have been successful without what Karen did and the foresight that she had back in the fall. So for every program that's out there, the money that's out there, one person making a big difference on our systems really, really helped all of that occur. And we couldn't be happier that she was able to pull that off. Not only did she do that in all of her normal operations manager job, Karen manages the hotline at the National Coalition for Homeless Veterans. And that hotline historically had been a referral line, albeit an important one, but that's mainly what it was, is it was for people who maybe found our organization online to be able to call us and we could refer them out to those of you in the community that are on the front lines and could to provide them that service. And that's still what it does in, in, in large part. However, where Karen has taken it to an entirely different level is Karen's not a person who just refers somebody on to something and then forgets. Karen is a formerly homeless veteran herself. And she has tremendous passion for the people who find themselves in those circumstances. So she's not just going to say, why don't y'all call over here and then forget about it. No, she helps people find where they need to go. She asks them to follow up with her. She helps them again if, if at first it's not working out the way it should be. She helps with creative solutions. And she's just a person that they can lean on while they're going through this process of getting reconnected. She's had to solve some uh, problems that were new for all of us. She helped one veteran who was living on a boat who had a challenge of being evicted from the slip at the dock. Not something that kind of fits into the normal mode of how we're addressing these issues. And Karen went ahead and helped this person work through that. Um, she is just a tremendous asset for all of us across the country in, in the fight against veteran homelessness. Can't think of a better person to win the Unsung Hero Award. Um, and congratulations, Karen. You've done just a tremendous work. And, and we know that you're going to continue to do that in the future. Thanks so much. COVID has changed the face of this country for the last six months and will likely change the way that many of us operate and do business over the long term. It has revealed what many of us have long known are systemic and institutional inequities in this country. And while we've seen a significant amount of data from civilian departments of health, VA's data hasn't been as transparent. The last public reporting that we're aware of that broke down 
COVID infections by race at VA was from July, and it logged about 48% of veteran cases as being among Black and Hispanic veterans. But that population made up only 23% of those tested at the time. COVID has demanded a lot from all of us across the country, especially all of us in this field who are serving veterans and advocating on their behalf. Um, I think I speak for all of us in this movement when I say that we've all risen to the occasion and then some. One of the things that you may not know about NCHV is that we operate a toll-free hotline and we've seen a dramatic increase in callers over the last few weeks as federal eviction moratoria expired and then came back in a different form. We've also seen that our advocacy work has picked up in terms of asking for additional data, in terms of requesting more testing and PPE for providers. But one of the things that we're most proud of is that we've heard a lot from each and every one of you. And you all have been kind and candid enough to share with us your challenges. And we've been able to really carry some of that information up to Congress and back to the administration to advocate for the things that you need to serve veterans. We've asked for sufficient funding. We've asked for policy changes. We've asked for all kinds of things to help you serve veterans better. And we're pleased to see that many of the things that we've requested have been implemented. Um, it's no secret, and you all know this, I'm preaching to the choir, but we are so thankful to see that $700 million of VA's CARES funding was distributed to grantees across the country. And that $700 million was hard to come by, but we're thankful for it because it'll allow all of you to provide services to the very veterans who we care most about. However, we do think that $700 million is probably not gonna be sufficient and that we need to ensure that full funding is provided for all of these programs to meet the ongoing needs, given it doesn't feel like there is much of an end in sight when it comes to this pandemic. There has been a lot of emphasis during these dark days on applauding the folks who are on the front lines, whether they're medical professionals or first responders. And I think those two groups especially deserve all of the applause that we give them. But one of the groups that we don't hear enough about are some of the other first line responders when it comes to people who are operating emergency shelters or running permanent supportive housing. People like you who are out there every day as essential workers doing your best to make life a little bit better for someone who's in need. And I want you to know <laughs> that we all here at NCHV, our staff, our board, our founders, all of us applaud each and every one of you for everything that you're doing. We know that you all are on the front lines trying to connect people to shelter, to housing, to employment, to legal services, to all of the benefits that they need. And some of you are even out doing outreach actively in the middle of a pandemic, and that is no small feat. Now, I know that some of you have sacrificed more than others and have put yourself at risk in order to fulfill your mission and serve veterans. And I just want you to know that all of you are NCHV's unsung heroes for this year. We're proud of every single one of you who continues to serve veterans. We're proud of the work that you do. We're proud of every single veteran you move into housing now more than ever, given all that you're doing. I'm here today to present the Gerald Washington Memorial Founders Award. This award is to recognize an individual who's had meritorious dedication in the fight against veterans homelessness and has made substantial contributions at a national level. Today, I'm gonna to give that award to Carlos Martinez, although unfortunately a little bit late. Before I talk about Carlos, I wanna be sure and mention his wife, Rita. As we all know, when you work at a nonprofit and you're tackling tough issues like veteran homelessness, it's a hard job. There's long hours, it's 24 seven, and you're only as strong in that fight as the support network you have at home. And Rita supported Carlos and the mission for over 40 years. We are so thankful for her service as well. 
I want to talk a little bit about Carlos as a person. There's a place that you can go and you can look at the list of things that he's done and the organizations he's been a part of. But I want to talk about what made him such a special person and such a special leader and such a great contributor in the fight against veteran homelessness. Carlos Martinez made us all better. He made us stronger. He made us wiser. He made us kinder. He made us more compassionate. He made us a better team. He helped inspire people to do things that they didn't even know that they could do themselves. Carlos was a leader from a policy perspective on a national level, but he also brought such great practical experience to everything that we did on a national level through the wonderful organization down in Texas that he was a part of. The NCHV board recently had the opportunity to go visit that organization down in Texas and got to see firsthand how much Carlos cared about that team, how we connected with the veterans that were being served there, and to see the opportunities and the possibilities for how we can actually help veterans. Carlos made every person at all levels better. Carlos connected with people at board levels. Carlos connected with senior people across the country in all types of roles. Carlos connected to every person without any regard as to their personal situation or status. He was a wonderful leader in, in that regard. Carlos will be missed. I believe that somewhere Carlos is watching this and he's saying, okay, Steve, this is all well and good, but let's wrap it up because there's a lot of work that still needs to be done. And you're right, Carlos, there is a lot of work that still needs to be done. And we're going to do it and we're going to do it through the inspiration that you gave us and through the abilities that you helped us develop. I can't think of a better person for this award. You'll be missed, my friend.
Steve, thank you for your heartfelt words. I'm going to talk to you about Carlos' history so that you know that the man he really is or really was. He was born to parents that lived in Mexico in an orphanage and eventually came to the city of San Antonio to live. Carlos was born in San Antonio and he grew up in a poor side of town, but this had no bearing on his like, accomplishments. At the age of 26, he started with the American GI Forum as an outreach worker. In two years, at the age of 28, he became the director, uh, taking over a six month program. And he quickly assessed and knew that he was gonna have to get additional funding to continue. So he started the work by meeting with those powers that be in San Antonio, if you will, um, trying to convince him how, how much there was a need for veteran, uh, veteran services, in this case, Vietnam veteran services. And so he submitted a proposal and uh, the program was funded. The funny story about this is when he came back, once he signed the contract, uh, came back to the office, uh, he found that the movers were already there to move all of our equipment because that was supposed to be our last day. Um, you can imagine how elated the employees were knowing that we would continue our services. So we sent the packing company back to where they came from. In 1979, Carlos wrote a proposal to the Department of Labor, and which was funded, and we started our first expansion timeframe. We opened up five cities in the state of Texas. And for many years, we operated 10 cities in, in Texas and in five other states as well. Carlos was the sole proposal writer for over 30 years and he was an intellect and a visionary. During his career, he obtained his bachelor's and master's degree in business uh, by attending the university um, weekends and evenings as well. Carlos wrote the organization's mission statement in the early 70s, and he, he didn't just reach those goals and objectives, but he exceeded them. He wrote, maintain an array of veteran and family services, establish innovative programs of service that would generate self-sustaining mechanisms and accomplish at least 100 affordable uh, housing units. Today, we have served over 400,000 veterans and families in the past 47 years. We own seven buildings in San Antonio. We operate two businesses, one which uh, provides and mails out around the world Army retirement kits, and we produce a corrugate product for the U.S. Post Office since 1997. This was the self-sustaining mechanism that he dreamt of in the 70s. This, these businesses gave us the opportunity, the means to build a residential center for homeless, homeless veterans, which currently house 160 veterans. You can see why some of us thought he walked on water. Everything he touched became, came to tr fruition. Throughout his career, he had one-to-one -one meetings with five different presidents discussing veterans' needs. He was kind, he was funny, and a very humble man. On behalf of his family and the NVOP staff, I thank you for this distinguished honor you have bestowed upon him. The recognition of his labor of love, serving veterans. Carlos will always be in our hearts. Thank you. 
Pilots was a giant among men, and I am thankful for his leadership, his impact, and the example that he set for us all. Let us all let his past and his legacy, along with the legacy our founders and predecessors have created, inspire us through these troubled times. Now, I'm going to offer a quick orientation to help you navigate the next two weeks of this crazy virtual conference. Uh, first things first, the 2020 annual conference app and guidebook is about to be your new best friend. If you haven't downloaded it, please download it to your phone, open it on your computer. You can access it via the passcode that you got in your Welcome to Conference email. In the app, you'll find links to access all of our virtual content. You'll find workshop descriptions, speaker names, speaker bios. Um, you'll also find recorded videos of sessions after they're complete. Um, some workshops will have supplemental resources to help you move the ball forward in your community. And most importantly, the app is a means to interact with fellow attendees. And I have it on good authority that there might be some really great gift card giveaways. So you got to go check it out. All right. Um, in terms of content, this week's workshops are going to be great. The affordable housing workshop track sponsored by the Home Depot Foundation will focus in on how best to connect veterans to affordable housing, and innovative ways in which to increase its availability in your community. The employment income and benefits track sponsored by city We'll focus on connecting veterans to employment and other benefits and services in support of housing stability. Every day, we're going to have one workshop from each track, accessible via the app or the daily email link. Uh, links to the recorded sessions will be available 24 hours after the session finishes. And last but not least, every morning you will get an update email that has the links to the sessions for the day, so that if you're someone who isn't interested in that and all the really great giveaways we got, you'll still be able to access the conference content. Uh, last but not least, we do have a hashtag and we certainly hope that you'll keep the conversation going on social media with the hashtag NCHV2020. Once again, that's NCHV2020. I hope you all have a great conference and we look forward to seeing you in some really wonderful workshops tomorrow. Bye.